303 <laughs> from our standard nursing room. Um, today, we are very fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Fatima Rodriguez. Um, <clears throat> so I'll provide a little bit of background. Um, Dr. Rodriguez is an associate professor in cardiovascular medicine at Stanford. Uh, she earned her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and her MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health. She then completed internal medicine residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Stanford University. She serves as the section chief of preventive cardiology there and specializes in cardiovascular disease prevention, inherited lipid disorders, and cardiovascular risk assessment in high-risk populations. Um, she has quite an impressive research profile. Um, I know, uh, as Layla was mentioning, she uh, is looked up to over here um, from many of our fellow perspectives and um, has a lot of uh, collaborators here too. So we're very excited to be uh, joined by you, Dr. Rodriguez, um, and your talk on artificial intelligence. Thank you so much for welcoming me. Uh, close by, yet it seems far away. I haven't been here in a long time. It's great to see so many old friends, mentors, people that are still in fellowship, Andy. And thank you, my, my good friend, I just wanna give a shout out to Jeff who works in the Department of Public Health who also made the trek over. We're friends from medical school and he's a UCSF alum, so thanks Jeff. Okay, so I, my topic today is really encompasses some work that we've been doing around artificial intelligence. Specifically, and I wanna be specific about this as a tool to help us in cardiovascular disease prevention. Is the audio okay? I'm getting an echo. Okay. These are my disclosures that are not relevant for this talk. So today I'm gonna to cover four topics that our group has really been really interested in speaking about cardiovascular prevention. First is opportunistic screening and using again AI as a tool for this, large language models, public perceptions around status using the tools of AI, and I'll end with everybody's favorite chat GPT. So I recently came across this article that was published in JAMA by folks from Google talking about the evolution of AI in healthcare. And again, AI in healthcare is actually not new and has been around since the 1950s. If you think of AI as more as simplistic as a tool where a machine learns from human knowledge and into computational rules, and that's really AI 1.0. And this can follow those rules directly and there's a lot of examples of this, like IBM's Deep Blue that beat the world champion in chess. And again, this is really when we think about clinical decision support tools, this is AI 1.0. And many of us use this in our workflow, especially around cardiovascular health metrics. Now, thinking about AI 2.0, which is a lot of our algorithms focus on that, on deep learning. And this is a prediction based on a ground truth where you're, we are labeling a data set. And again, this is the examples that people give you. Is it a dog? Is it a cat based on certain features? Everybody has an iPhone. It's amazing how iPhones can find pictures of folks. Jeff and I recently just got together and my phone found all the pictures of us as we were you know, young, much younger. We still look the same, right, Jeff? But again, very good. The iPhone is able to do this and this is based on deep learning algorithms. Now, I think the AI that has gotten a lot of attention recently is this AI 3.0, or the foundation models, which is a much more recent phenomenon, or generative AI, which is transforming a lot of our care delivery processes, which we'll talk about. But are, there's also risks associated with this, right? So this is things like we've heard about hallucinations. And again, based on the data, can it actually make wrong assumptions that can affect us in clinical care? So the same way we think about a framework for AI, I, I'm a preventive cardiologist and we think about cardiovascular prevention among a continuum. So sometimes we artificially divide this into different categories, but really it is a risk continuum. Ideally, all of us with a public health background really focus on primordial prevention. How do we prevent risk factors from developing in the first place? And that starts outside of the healthcare system and again, can't start early enough in childhood. Now, primary prevention is where we focus on preventing disease by targeting risk factors. But a lot of us in preventive cardiology focus on something that we call prevention 1.5. If we can identify people at higher risk based on things like subclinical atherosclerosis, which is coronary calcium, carotid plaque, we can kind of intensify and tailor therapies. And then in the clinical setting, we focus a lot on secondary prevention, uh, again, those high risk patients. So I'll give you an example again about a very great use case that we have found for AI in clinical care 
for opportunistic clean screening for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. So in preventive cardiology, we often rely on something called a gated coronary artery scan. I know many of you are familiar with this. So this is a dedicated specialized type of CT scan that is gated to the beating heart and can very accurately quantify the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries and measured in Agatston units. And again, this number, as you can see here from this data from the Mesa study, shows a very nice graded association with the higher the number, the higher association of cardiovascular events. And again, this is all based on very high quality observational data, but again, can help us decide does this person need to be intensified in terms of therapy. Inversely, when you have a calcium score of zero, that can also help de-risk individuals, and that often motivates our patients to get these scans. Sounds great, very valuable, low-dose radiation CT scans. So why don't we use them for everybody? Because there's no randomized controlled trial data showing that this improves outcomes, these types of scans are not covered by insurance, and they do incur a large Again, it could be minimal, but again, for some people, it's large out-of-pocket cost uh, to get these. And at our institution, the price has actually just gone up. And I hear here is quite expensive as well. So again, there's some disparities in who can access these type of scans. My colleague, Dr. Kim Williams, actually showed that in Chicago, the accessibility, just having a CAC scan nearby was really associated with social determinants, where there were many fewer CAC scans in areas with lower household income, lower educational attainment, and in neighborhoods with a higher proportion of African Americans. Now, the Cleveland Health System actually does something very interesting, where they removed the out-of-pocket costs for these scans, and then they saw an increased uptake, particularly from diverse populations, for this type of screen, I would say, refining technology. But we know that many of our patients have scans all of the time, right, that are done for non-cardiac reasons. About 19 millions of these non-gated chest CT scans are done annually. And again, we saw an uptick of these during COVID looking at lung uh, pathophysiology. So there's been a lot of work showing that the presence of coronary calcium in these types of scans can be very helpful in refining cardiovascular risk prediction as well as the gated scans. So this really presents an opportunity to identify those at higher risk, again, without doing any additional tests or radiation, and an opportunity to address the health equity issues of who the gated scans are accessible to. So our group became very interested in this and thought about how can we class this as a research question and thinking about opportunistic imaging. So what is opportunistic imaging? So this is testing that is done for other reasons. Again, the ordering provider may do this to follow up on a lung nodule, follow up on pneumonia symptoms. People do this all the time. For example, you get an abdominal CT and you look at osteoporosis. These are, you know, in, can be incidental findings. But instead of incidental, we want to use these to help guide cardiovascular prevention. A technology that has been very, you know, our radiology colleagues have really been um, at the forefront of adopting this type of, of things because, again, the data is already sitting there in radiology archives. So a question that our group has asked commonly is, can we use incidental calcium that is quantified through AI to help us guide preventive therapies? Now, I'll stop and say that the technology for this always is changing. And again, the algorithm, I don't think in itself is the innovation, but the application of the algorithm that can really help us. So at Stanford, there's a, a really smart group of computer science master students shown here, Dave and Nish, who uh, created a company called Bunker Hill that was able to very accurately quantify the amount of coronary calcium in a non-gated chest CT scan. Again, with the ground truth of, these, of this deep learning algorithm is actually gated scans. And they did this across sites and using MESA data and healthcare system data. And again, you can see that the performance of this algorithm is excellent and again, just continues to get better as they add more data to their training set with a high sensitivity and positive predictive volume for the presence of coronary artery calcium. And again, these are scans done for totally different reasons. So excellent performance in this paper was published as an MPJ digital medicine and again, had the added advantage that the gold standard or the ground truth is what we use in clinical practice. So this work was led by one of our students who is now who will be heading to Johns Hopkins for cardiology fellowship, Allison Peng, who again showed that the presence of DL CACs or the deep learning quantified coronary artery calcium 
predicted events, cardiovascular events, all-cause mortality in a graded fashion, just like regular CAC was expected to do. But in addition to that, the population that we are now able to identify was very different from that population that has gated CT scans that really matched the demographics of our patient population at Stanford. Again, with a large, uh, more, more women than men, 18% Asian, 13% Hispanic, Latinx. And most of these scans had, a prevalent, had at least some coronary calcium. And again, these were patients without known ASCVD. So this was information just sitting in their medical records. And much like coronary calcium ascertained from gated scans, scores over 100 were associated with ASCVD events. Allison looks specifically, okay, what are the difference between the two populations that we can identify? And again, we can see that patients who have not gated chest CT scans, this is done for other reasons. So clearly they have more clinical comorbidities are shown here. Again, more often women. A lot of them had interpreter needs. So again, think about the diversity of this population. We talked about the racial ethnic composition of this population and the insurance type was much more likely to be Medicaid than private. And despite having a high burden of coronary calcium, most of these patients as we see in clinical practice were not on statins. So the next question is like, okay, can we use this information that is again, as a screening tool to look through a large body of CT scans to identify patients who may benefit from additional preventive therapies. So this was work that was led by Alex Sandu, who's one of our um, new junior faculty in our department, Division of Cardiology and Preventive uh, Medicine. And the Notify One study, we identified patients that had a history of ASCVD who had calcium present on their chest CT, not on a statin and had primary care again within our last two years at Stanford. So we see that we actually lost a lot of patients in our workflow because of the lack of primary care and routine care in our system. And what did we find? We found that again, this AI enabled intervention helped identify patients that were at high risk. So when we dug through CT scans, we found around 50% of them had calcium. We, with the help of a radiologist, we, uh, you know, even I'm not an imaging person, but I, I could tell that's not good. You know, that's a lot of calcium in the arteries. We put a big red circle around it. We sent a, a letter to the primary care physician. And this is what the letter looked like. Again, showing this is a picture of your patient's scan. Again, that was done for other reasons. We found it using an AI algorithm. Based on the presence of this calcium, you may want to talk to your patients about considering statin therapy. If we don't hear from you in two weeks, we'll notify your patients. So two weeks later, if we didn't hear from them, we notify their patient. And again, this was done as a QI study, and you could just see the language is a little much more patient-friendly, even though they may not agree. But again, this is a picture of your heart, big red circle around something that shouldn't be there. This is a presence of coronary artery calcium. Talk to your physician about considering statin therapy. Now, what did we find? So again, this was we did not prescribe any medications. It was just notifying the patient and the clinician with a personalized image. So in patients that were not notified, the usual care of statin initiation rates at six months was around 7%. But those that were notified, 51% of them started statins at six months. So this is a, a very large effect size, again, for a technology that's relatively low touch, but can, again, can have a massive effect when implemented in a wider scale. And there was also a halo effect around other cardiovascular risk factors. So as patients, again, most of them saw a clinician in a visit, they started controlling their blood pressure better, their hemoglobin A1C, but there was also more care visits. Patients were more likely to have stress testing, um, coronary angiograms. So that is the reason I think it's very important that we study this to make sure that the intended effects happen. And we have a patient who is part of our research group, and his name is Doug, and he's allowed us to share his information. So Doug had a CT scan to follow up on a thyroid cancer five years ago. And it wasn't until recently he came into the care of a cardiologist to say, whoa, do you know that you have a lot of coronary calcium? I'm just pulling up your CT images. So Doug was very upset that it had been five years since he was notified of the fact that he has significant coronary artery calcification and could be at risk for heart disease. And he's very excited about this technology. So we have Doug writing papers with us, joining our research group. And again, just understanding his perspective on how this information could be used to help guide preventive care. 
we've started surveying patients and talking to them in focus groups. And a lot of our patients were grateful for this information, but of course, you know, we think it's great that they're notified, but there was a lot of distress around the scan. Um, I think one of our patients told us they were at Costco when they received the letter and they almost dropped dead from the email. So that's that's not good. So we wanna make sure we're, we try to balance the efficacy again without causing undue patient distress. So to try to do this better and to get into more diverse patient uh, population, we've been working with our evaluation sciences unit and the National Minority Health Alliance to try to understand again, not just the patients who are part of the study, but all patients who may be notified again who've had CT scans, how do you feel about us using AI tools in your imaging records? Is this acceptable to you? How can we communicate this in a way that you understand? And how can we translate this again to care pathways that everybody has access to? We've now started looking at what happened, okay, not just at six months, but an extended period in the Notify Extend trial. And we're analyzing that data now, but again, showing a lot of statin persistence at one year after notification. I just want to give a big shout out to one of your new faculty, Dr. Ramsey Dudum, who's coming here soon, who's leading the Notify Picture study with our group. And this is a Doris Duke funded study looking at the real time effects of notification. Again, these are scans as they're happening. We're notifying the patients and clinicians, and we're actually including patients with ASCVD here who are not on statins and trying to understand uh, how that affects uh, not just statin rates, but also other cardiovascular risk factors. We also noticed that a lot of our patients actually had a diagnosis of ASCVD and were not on statins. So again, we had excluded them, but now we're like, okay, could visualizing coronary artery plaque motivate behavior change, even in these patients who have such a strong guideline indication for statin therapy? And that's what we're looking at in our Notify ASCVD study. And again, not just looking at statins particularly, but all lipid lowering therapy and secondary outcomes. We've recently submitted a grant to see Okay, now we know it's going to improve statin rates, but does it improve cardiovascular outcomes, especially in patients who have competing risk of other diseases that are resulting in their need for their CT scan? So lung cancer screening patients are a great example, right? These are patients that are undergoing annual lung CT scans that are not gated, they're low radiation. So we've worked on enhancing the algorithm to work on these CT scans that, again, are a little blurrier, as you can see here. There's a lot of shared risk factors between this population, ASCVD populations. So we've designed a, a trial for that. And we recently got funded for a registry called the, the NICE registry that is enhancing uh, the sites that we're looking at this, again, and seeing how does it predict across diverse populations, different health systems, expand the algorithms to different kinds of scans, and then really focus on qualitative data to understand how this could apply uh, to pay patients and clinicians, because again, a lot of this falls on the primary care clinician who has a lot of other things to worry about. So we just talked about one type of opportunistic imaging. And again, we see here that there's a lot more abdominal imaging. So about 20 million abdominal CT scans are done each year. And again, there's a lot of opportunities there to identify undiagnosed cardiometabolic disease. I've spoken just about calcium, but you could imagine that there's all sorts of things that we can glean from um, body CT scans. And this is uh, our group here at Stanford Artificial Intelligence Medicine Center, Akshay Chowdhury is leading this work, showing that visceral fat and other, again, not surprising to us, can predict cardiovascular risk. And not just cardiovascular risk, but again, the risk of other diseases that are all very closely linked. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about another exciting um, application of large language models in our electronic health record. So just to get everybody on the same page, what are large language models? So large language models are AI algorithms that are trained on billions of measures of unlabeled text using self-supervised or semi-supervised learning, and it can understand, process, and, and produce human language. Um, has anybody here used ChatGPT? Raise your hand if you have. Not everybody? Okay, by the end of this talk, hopefully everybody has tried this. But again, this can really help you generate human language and understand it based, again, on training of large data sets. So our group was interested in thinking about, can we use not even the large language models, but just EHR data to understand why our highest risk patients are not prescribed statins? And I'll tell you that this was actually started with a much simpler question. So David Marin, who everybody knows is a, is a leader in preventive cardiology, at one of our preventive cardiology meetings, he asked me, what proportion of our ASCVD patients are taking statins in our clinic? 
it's a hundred percent, right? I said, I don't know. I actually have no idea. And this data is not as easy to pull as one would think just as an electronic health query. And we've seen this time and time again in multiple studies showing that there are significant gaps in how we implement guidelines across all populations. And this is recent data showing that even in insured populations, patients with ASCVD, only half of them are taking a statin and even fewer are taking the guideline directed high intensity statin with disparities. Again, women much more like less likely to take a high intensity statin. Patients with non-coronary ASCVD, cerebrovascular disease, PAD, and paradoxically, those with more comorbidities, again, less likely to be on statins. So we know this is a problem across all health systems. So I'll now show you the Stanford data, but again, saying that this is true nationally. So we identified patients with an ASCVD diagnosis at Stanford. We ensured that they had regular care within our health system, so that narrowed the population. Identified uh, you know, the broad definition of ASCVD and found that about 60% of patients in our healthcare system that we studied in this time period were on any statins with an ASCVD diagnosis coded on two different encounters. So again, maybe slightly better than national average, but not great. So when you looked at the patients who were on statins, even fewer of them were on high intensity statins, really one in four of the total ASCVD patients. But we were less interested in that group. I think we've documented that it's been seen in national data. We're much more interested in why are we not prescribing statins to the other people? And a lot of our clinicians may say, okay, they're allergic or they're intolerant. And it turns out very few of these patients had a discrete statin allergy documented in their EHR data. So only 3.5% of patients. And again, in our EHR, I'm sure yours is similar. It lets you put intolerance. You don't have to say a frank allergy. So then we said, okay, can we look at, use these clinical notes to kind of dig further to why our people may not be on statins, just beyond the discrete allergy, no allergy. So we developed an NLP clinical BERT model to try to, again, see what people are writing. And this requires, for those of you who haven't done this, manual annotation of a set of notes, and you can kind of classify into the big categories and then evaluate the rest of the notes. So the first lesson that we learned from this was that actually, and this is probably true in your health system too, 39% of those patients who were not on statins in these clinical notes were on statins, which is not documenting it well. So the problem is a little bit less, right? They just, maybe they fill their medication in a different healthcare system. Maybe the clinician said they have the prescription somewhere else. So some of this is just how we ascertain endpoints and NLP approaches can help us get a much better um, definition of those. So the reasons for non-statin use based on clinical notes were varied and they were not what we thought. In our hypothesis, we thought, you know, myalgias are common reasons or patients in clinical practice may tell us they don't take statins. That was not a majority of, of the side effects that were documented, at least by the clinician. A lot of them were atypical side effects, headaches, GI distress, again, things that, that we may not put to the top of the list, concerns around memory. There was a lot of also clinician re justified reasons. So a lot of them were saying things like the LDLs good. So, you know, we know that's not a guideline concordant practice because it, irrespective of your LDL, you should be on a statin if you have an ASCVD. And a lot of clinical inertia. Defer to next visit. I think has an appointment with cardiology coming up. Um, see next time. And we started of seeing some disparities around that with for some patients, for example, we saw for some of the Hispanic patients, there was a lot more comments around social determinants of health. They have a lot going on, no time to discuss statins at this visit. So we were fairly surprised to find this. And again, that generated data um, for further work. There were also gender disparities became pretty apparent. And again, this was work led by one of our excellent residents, Celeste Whitting. First of all, women were, as we've seen in many studies, were less likely to use statins. And even in the clinical notes, there was much less mention of discussion around statins. And a lot of the discussions were based more around side effects or like women just have more side effects, more intolerance. So again, we see a lot of this documented. When we looked at a, a similar study with patients with diabetes, again, these tend to be younger patients. These are without ASCVD. Fewer of these patients were on statins. And again, the reasons were a lot more patient-centered in this cohort doesn't want to take a lifelong medication, their LDL is okay, and still we saw the clinical inertia. 
we started expanding this work to not just look at statins, but other guideline directed practices that, again, we have good evidence for. We started looking things around anticoagulation for patients with atrial fibrillation. And a lot of these reasons are, are fairly actionable. For example, we've identified a lot of discussion around aspirin, so not on anticoagulation because they're on aspirin. So again, there could be some room for signing interventions that can help us. And again, trying to understand that there are certain populations where we're identifying these patterns. We have folks in our groups also interested in um, GDMT for heart failure. Okay, moving right along to the third part, which is AI to understand public perceptions around statins. So as we know, as much as we have great data on certain things that we do in medicine, our patients do not read peer review articles. So a surprise folks, I have a few patients who say, send me the article, send me the article. But in general, what do patients do? They go on Google. So what does Google say about statins? So this is, again, uh, there's, there's so much, I could, I could give a whole talk on this. There's a lot of discussion about the dangers of statins, you know, five reasons why you should not take statins. Number one is they don't work. Statin nation two, what really causes heart disease. So there was a statin nation one at some point. Sometimes there's things that are overblown. Can statins help treat Ebola? I was not aware of that. But again, there's a lot of discussions. And this, this looks like it, it maybe even be the New York Times. And then the grave dangers of statins and the surprising benefits of high cholesterol. So, so we're interested in trying to understand perceptions around statins in social media. And there had been some work done uh, that was qualitative looking at perceptions on statins on Twitter. So we are hoping to use an AI approach to do this at a larger scale and also less manual annotation so we didn't have preconceived notions about what we think our patients would say around statins. And again, I don't know how many of you use Reddit. I certainly don't, don't but it, it's a very large social media platform with greater than 430 million active monthly users. As we can see, the discussions around statins have really exponentially increased in the past decade. This is the kind of discussions that individuals are having. Again, there's a lot of examples. I actually, uh, some of them, I, I told our, our resident who led this study that you could not put this in a peer reviewed uh, paper, but this was about the dangers, ooh. Sorry, this IT, my screen went away. Okay, well, uh, but from what I've been seeing, there's concern regarding statins, and most of you guys have mentioned trying to do everything but to take the statins, and obviously there's a lot of discussions around this online. Just my screen just went off. So again, in trying to use a, an approach where we didn't identify what we thought the themes were, Okay, sure. Okay, so I have to move my head. I should have mic'd up. So we identified, you know, 100 topics. And again, the, A the oh, great, thinking the AI algorithm uh, picked these topics and then these overarching themes. And again, this work was around the COVID pandemic. So a lot of these groups may, may be uh, related for certain reasons. There was like a, around ketogenic diets, a lot of discussion about supplements and how those could be substitute statins. A lot of side effect with discussions, not surprisingly, a hesitancy appraising clinical trials. And again, a lot of these themes have emerged over and over again. We could also use a, a model called a Roberta, a pre-trained model to try to study the positivity or negativity, so the sentiments around statins. And not surprisingly, most of these discussions, as many are around disease states, tend to be negative or neutral, as shown here. We recently looked at what are people saying about coronary calcium? Again, this is something that people may have to pay out of pocket for. So what are people saying around this? Interestingly, there was a, a lot of discussion again about getting coronary artery calcium scans to de-risk yourself. So a lot of it to avoid taking statins, which emerged as a strong group. So there was 14 groups. Some of them are, are pretty interesting about celebrities with CAC and uh, pets with heart scans. But more clinically actionable were things about incorrect use of CAC testing. So a lot of the posts actually were talking to use CAC testing to work up symptoms, palpitations, VT. You know, that is not a clinically approved indication for CAC testing. So again, an opportunity to combat misinformation. And the patient perceived downsides around CAC testing, which was the radiation risk, the out-of-pocket costs, although generally these discussions tended to favor this test. Now, we repeated this analysis in a topic that our patients love GOP-1 receptor agonists in the news. Again, 
our patients are, are very excited about these therapies. And again, here, using similar but maybe more refined methods, we found a lot more discussions. And again, these have exponentially increased since the cardiovascular benefits of these drugs. So this identified 168 topics, 33 groups. A lot of these, just to summarize a small print, are about the different kinds of GLP-1, which one's better, which one do you get the most weight loss effects. Some emerging side effects. So again, our patients may, may be telling us this and posting us on social medias about ways that actually you can get this medication in the black market. Again, things we would encourage that are less regulated. And this, and surprisingly, not maybe not surprisingly, these discussions tend to be much more positive than any other health-related discussions because of the weight loss benefits. So I'll conclude now talking about um, another good use case for AI and preventive, which is our patient education for chat GPT. So again, I, I heard, saw that not everybody here has used chat GPT. And I'll, I'll give you, I can tell you in the Q&A, some good use cases uh, for medicine, um, for research and, and for that are approved and you know allowed. But a chat GPT is essentially a chat box that responds to queries interactively across topics and fields and learns from your responses. So when you create an account, it can learn your style. Um, and somebody told me that they use it. They said, you know, you, can you write a recommendation letter in the style of this physician? So it kind of learns from you, especially as you give it more information. Chat GPT has been all over the news. Chat GPT may be better bedside manners. I'll show you the study for that. And again, it's exciting, but we need to have some guardrails against, especially when we put in patient information. So uh, at least at Stanford, we have a HIPAA compliant chat GPT version. I'm sure you guys do as well. So that you cannot, just as a reminder, ever put patient information in these open AI methods, because again, they're learning from this information. So this is work that was led by amazing, um, he was a cardiology fellow at the time, now is faculty at the Cleveland C Clinic, Dr. Ashish Suraju. So he asked a very interesting question earlier on when this first came out is, can we use chat GPT to help our patients in preventive cardiology? How appropriate are the recommendations? And what he did is that he created 25 simple questions that can come up in our preventive cardiology clinic around um, cardiovascular prevention guidance and treatments. And then he posed each question to chat GPT three times and then had expert cardiologists and preventive grade their responses into appropriate, meaning they were consistent inappropriate or unreliable. And this is an example of the kind of questions that he posed. And again, they're all on the paper, but I have muscle pain with the statin. What should I do? Again, you can see it's a fairly nuanced response. If you're experiencing muscle pain with the statin, you should talk to a doctor. Muscle pain is, can be a known side effect, you know, et cetera. So it's a, a fairly uh, nuanced, a uh, good answer that seemed reasonable. So here are the questions that Ashish posed. And 21 out of 25 or 84% were deemed appropriate by experts in preventive cardiology. And interestingly, the four responses that were inappropriate were either highly personalized. So for example, how much exercise should I do? Or should I do cardio or lift weights? And again, a lot of the stuff where the data may be changing. There's also something that was deemed appropriate was around inclusion. So inclusion is a novel treatment. So a lot of the data hadn't been available for this model to learn from yet. Or somebody mentioned my LDL is, is 200 milligrams per deciliter. For us in preventive cardiology, that jumps out. Could this be familiar hypercholesterolemia? And again, this is a topic that the models may be not, it's maybe too niche of a topic. So that was inappropriate. I think it, the response was try diet and exercise. So again, at the conclusion of this study, and I think there's many, many, many other studies like, I don't know, with AFib and, and other things, that it can be very helpful to augment patient education and patient clinician communications, but there still si exist significant limitations and, and there's guardrails that we need to impose. So there's a concept of confabulation or hallucinations where inaccurate information may be presented in a very confident manner. So they'll give you journal citations, the journal of statins, and as it, you know, it's very, very precise. And again, it's learning. It's kind of like a fill in the blank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they and they're they're not they could be non-existent, right? But again, you can look these, they sound very realistic to a patient. Again, can see that. Consensus mirroring. So if there's some opinions that are more common than others, it may mirror those and they may not actually represent a nuanced point of view when there's areas of controversial. 
and I heard an AI speaker talk about this, that there's persistence of structural bias. And it's not necessarily that the AI is biased, it's just our world is biased, right? So it's learning from biased data. And of course, we need to make sure that there's a regulation if we're gonna use this as a clinical decision tool. This is a study that was cited uh, in, uh, quite a lot in social media, which is that they asked a group of patients, 195 patients in a social media forum to see which answers they thought were better physician answers or chat box answers. And the patients rated the chat box answers much more high quality and more empathetic. So that received quite a lot of media attention. Um, we, I'm sure you guys are doing similar things. We have a chat GPT integration with Epic EH, EHR where they're trying to do a pilot study to see can chat GPT respond to patient questions? How satisfactory is that? So they're doing pilot studies in different clinics and UCSD is already using this. And um, there's a new technology, this is a pilot study that was just done at Stanford looking at ambient artificial intelligence technology to help with medical note writing. And in the group of 48 physicians and variety of specialties, this AI powered ambient voice recognition, people thought that it was very easy to use. It can help save time, but actually only two out of three said it saved them time. But again, these are the kind of technologies that can be helping our physician workforce. And then, you know, could do cute things like this, write a very short poem about how to prevent heart disease. So this is uh, OpenAI version 3.5. So move, nourish, and care, prevent heart disease, be aware, exercise, eat right, let stress fade, a healthy heart, a life well made. So if you're wondering, is it worth upgrading to the version 4.0? Much longer poem, <laughs> much better rhyming. So uh, you, can, you can read this on your own, but again, I really like the feast on greens, fruits, grains so fine, let water be your chosen wine. So again, a little bit of a better poem if you wanna upgrade. So in summary, I think that artificial intelligence is a very promising tool, but it's not a standalone solution. So that's really critical. I was talking to Dr. Marcus this morning, and I think a lot of these companies will come and say, here's a solution for all your problems. And that's just the wrong way to go. You wanna start with the problem that's hopefully a clinically useful problem um, by our patients, and then use these technologies as tools. We have found you know, extreme value in using this incidental calcium um, that is quantified through a deep learning algorithm, again, in scans that have already been done to help um, guide clinical decision-making and enhance preventive strategies. And again, the technology in itself, the algorithms continue to get better and better. It's really what you do with these algorithms in our clinical care. So notifying the patients, creating care pathways if there are no primary care doctors to help um, improve guideline-directed therapy. AI pipelines can be used to explore unstructured data sources that are extremely abundant and valuable and may help us improve patient education. But I think a lot of the work around AI needs to focus on how we're going to implement it in a useful way in our clinical care and not just force it in, especially if it's not useful. And that's why I'm a big proponent of studying these technologies instead of just like implementing them because everybody has an algorithm. And then we have to make sure that we're not inadvertently making health disparities worse and thinking about algorithmic bias. And there are a lot of ways to think about that. I like to acknowledge in my, my research group, because some people have already even moved on from Stanford, but we still always consider them part of our group. And it's just been an honor to, to watch a lot of trainees develop. And you guys are getting an amazing one with Dr. Ramsey Dudum. Our Stanford Preventive Cardiology section, which has really been a, a big adopter of technologies that are help funding sources. And my three little ones. And happy to, to take any questions from, I think mean, you guys 